Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, this is Comprehensivist Wednesday, and today we are going to be focusing on Louis Sullivan. Um, now, as a way of introduction, you know, Louis Sullivan has been the most influential thinker uh, for me. Um, I have learned a lot from him. And it's, um, it's, his, his thought is very profound. It's just, just changes everything. Um, but I've had the hardest time to communicate that with other people. I have tried of the, I must have tried to, for many people, just to give you an example. I, when I read Kindergarten Chats, um, I was so excited about it, is that I bought 32 copies and gave it to everybody whom I thought was any good, okay? And I had a very odd re reaction. There were a few, maybe about, I would say, four or five people who thought it was the greatest thing that they have ever read. And it was really life transforming for them. Then there is a whole bunch of thing, people who said, oh, that's, that's interesting, very interesting. And then, some people, like about one third of the people, said, what is this? Why did you give me this? Okay. And so I, I got very impatient with that. So what I did was that I actually took the book and rewrote the whole book. I, I kind of edited it. I condensed it. I kind of combined different parts. So that, and so I wrote, it took me a year to do that. Like every week I would go ahead and take parts of the book and um, publish it on, on, on my blog. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, but over time, I must have talked with, you know, more than a hundred people about Louis Sullivan, either one-on-one -on -one or in meetups. And I find that of those hundred people, I'm able to communicate the real core value of Louis Sullivan's thought to only maybe about five people, five out of hundred. And for them, it just changes their life, okay? But for the rest of the people, the reactions vary from, oh, this is very interesting. I will look at, look at it. I will read something or to kind of, you know, complete befuddlement, okay? So I'm trying in this presentation to do better than my record, okay? So um, I want to find out exactly why it is. I mean, I think I know why it is. The reason for this kind of a reaction is that his ideas are fundamentally different from the core ideas that most people hold. Either most people are what you would call a platonist, where there's like primacy of ideas, or they're subjectivist. His idea is all about kind of embracing life and um, kind of inducing things about life and about what you need to be doing from that. Um, so we will go into that. So, so the question was, okay, given that I've been such a failure at communicating this, what do I do? So I had, I have three weapons. Okay. Actually two real strong weapons, but the third one is half a weapon. So the first one is Sherry Krasinski. Okay. Sherry is a good friend of mine. Uh, she's an architect. She knows this, uh, you know, she, she knows this in her bones. Um, and she's a, she's better at putting the entire context of his life and work. Um, so what we're going to do, so that's, that's weapon number one. And I'll come to the second weapon uh, later on. The third weapon, I'll, I'll forget about it. It's not that big. Um, so, so the structure of this meetup is that first, Sherry is going to be talking about the life and work of Louis Sullivan. So that's first part. Then we will open it up to questions. Now, questions at that point are going to be only about the details of the life and work of Louis Sullivan. Okay, so uh, what we're trying to do is that because it is such a hard thing to communicate, I'm going to try to do that in a systematic way. There are going to be multiple places where you can ask questions, but at each point, the questions have to be focused on the topic that has been presented. And then we will do general Q&A, and then you will have the opportunity of giving your takeaways. And that's where you can talk about everything, you know, all your views and everything. You'll get two full minutes to talk about, talk about that. So keep that for the end. Okay. First, we are going to just kind of 
understand what is being said, uh, then ask general questions and then give your takeaway. So that's that's how we're going to. So the so the sequence is Sherry's going to talk about life and work of Louis Sullivan, then we'll do Q and A, then. I'm going to talk about some key ideas of Louis Sullivan and why it is so difficult to, uh, what, is, what are the core of his ideas? Why is it so difficult to grasp them? And what is the way of going about doing that? Then Sherry is going to come back and she's going to apply or show you how Louis Sullivan applied his own ideas to the problem, the most famous problem he's uh, known for solving, and that is design of skyscraper. Uh, he's called the father of skyscraper. So she's going to analyze that. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about how I use Louis Sullivan's ideas to structure these meetups. So I'll talk about all the features of these meetups, which most of you are very, very familiar with. So that's, I think might work. At least you will be able to see how these ideas can be used, you know, one by Louis Sullivan himself, and one in a context that you're very familiar with. And hopefully, uh, you know, all of this, uh, I will, you know, I'll end up being a little bit more successful than five out of 100. You got about 50 people. So that means at least two and a half. If I do better than three, uh, that will be at least some improvement, but I'm hoping to do a lot better than that. Okay, um, and uh, so th with that, uh, you know, I'm delighted to welcome Sherry. You know, Sherry is a dear friend, um, and um, you know, I've known her for a long, long time. And uh, so it's just, uh, you know, I'm I'm just delighted to have her here. Uh, Sherry, uh, please take it away. All right, thank you, Shrikan. It's uh, it's a lot of fun to be here with you. Um, it's a great way to connect now that uh, we can't. Uh, uh, have these conversations. I, for the rest of you, I don't know if he's ever mentioned this, what we normally do when he comes to visit, um, my husband and I fight over who gets to pick Sri Kant up at the airport or the train station or whatever, and gets to have a nice hour long conversation without any interruption on the ride back home. And then we squabble again for at, when he has to leave, uh, who gets to drive him back. I usually come up with, um, some really convoluted excuses <laughs> to make sure that I get to do that, that honor. But honestly, we usually split it half and half. <laughs> yes. And, and then what happened was that because, well, because of COVID, I've not been able to visit these folks. Mm -hmm. And then I had Rob, Rob Trasinski over here talking about writing. And we did kind of our, you know, in the way, the way uh, Rob said was that this was just like having a conversation on the drive. Mm -hmm. And then Sherry said to me, how come I don't get to do that? <laughs> I said, again, we squabble now again. that you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> all, all right. Take it, take it away. Sherry. So um, I had a couple of different ways of doing this. Um, I could have done this as uh, like an architectural history lecture, showing a bunch of photographs of his buildings, talking about his architecture. But given what Srikant's trying to do, I thought it was really more important to focus on his ideas. Um, it fits butterflies in nicely with um, Sri Khan's plan. So um, let me first give you a few dates to kind of uh, put some brackets around this and we know what we're talking about. Um, Louis Sullivan was born in 1856. He died um, in, eight, in 1924. Um, his father was uh, an Irish immigrant, um, taught dance. Um, considered himself or wrote down his profession as artist at, at least one time in his life. So um, there was that artistic background. His mother um, of German descent uh, emigrated from Switzerland. Um, that's where the Henri, uh, Louis Henri comes from. Um, she was a piano player, quite accomplished. Um, and so you get that music and art is really, it's part of the soil of how he grew up. Um, they put, he spent a lot of time with his grandparents uh, on a farm out in the country. Um, so when they put him in school, he really balked at this idea of being stuck indoors, um, working at 
these educational things that he didn't he didn't he thought he learned much more from being out in the nature learning from um, watching the way things grew in the world so at one point he was actually sent to go live with his grandparents um, and because he balked so so badly at school um, his parents at his immediate family moved to chicago in 1870 um, at that time, he was uh, studying architecture school, architecture at MIT. He didn't finish his degree there, but he then left, um, worked uh, in a couple of pretty well-known places in, in, in Pennsylvania. He worked at furnaces, furnace office. Uh, in Chicago, he worked briefly at William LeBaron Jenny's office. Um, he was less architect, more engineer really the one behind um, the steel skyscraper construction method that is uh, the thing that allowed skyscrapers to be built. Uh, and he spent a couple of years in Paris at the, um, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, um, so studying there, and then came back to Chicago and worked at Dankmar Adler's architecture firm, and very, very quickly went from draftsman to um, a few years, not oh, maybe seven years later, I, I don't have the exact dates, uh, eventually became junior partner and then partner. And the firm of Adler and Sullivan is an extremely impressive big name in the Chicago um, skyscraper uh, industry. And that sort of gives you his start. But there's, in my view, an, an important element that is behind it that really puts an un, puts a good understanding on where his ideas and where his architecture uh, theories come from. And that is the story of the Great Chicago Fire. If any of you have heard of Mrs. O'Leary's Cow, has anybody have heard of Mrs. O'Leary's Cow? So um, it was 1871. Apparently, it was Mrs. O'Leary's Cow who knocked over an oil lantern. Now, just to get her out of the you know, hot box right away, uh, I think it was 1996 when the city of Chicago finally exonerated both the O'Leary family and the cow uh, and said that they actually did not start the fire. So anyway, what had happened at the Chicago fire was quite an important event in the lives of many architects at that time. So. The fire started um, in October, early October. It lasted for two days. Uh, it came on uh, several months of complete, a serious drought, like an inch of rain in four months or something like that. So everything was a tinderbox to begin with. Um, to make matters worse, buildings were all built out of wood. Uh, the sidewalks were built out of wood. Um, most of the roofing materials were flammable. So when this fire started, however it started, it ended up spreading really rapidly because of the wind. Um, if any of you have ever studied the way some of these wildfires uh, out, say in California a few years ago, they can make fire tornadoes um, where the heat inside of it gets so hot that it forms a, a vortex cloud and then can travel rapidly um, and in a very far distance. So what ended up happening is 100,000 people were left homeless. Um, not as many died as you would expect. I think they think it was about 300. Um, more than 17,000 buildings were destroyed. Uh, 2,000 acres in the heart of a city were decimated. There is a small handful of buildings that still exist in Chicago today that survived the fire, but we're talking fewer than five major buildings. So on top of all of that, well, I think the worst detail of it was that one third of all of Chicago's building value was destroyed in those two days. So, you're left with essentially a, a charred rump of rubble for a city. And uh, it was a major, major lo city location. Everything, all the commerce still needed to happen. 
Um, so immediately, lots of rebuilding happened. Uh, but of course, rebuilding after a fire like that, uh, everybody is thinking about how to not build in wood, how to build um, these newer buildings, um, how we make things that are safe so they don't burn down so that people can operate in these buildings. They were starting to get some taller buildings at the time, but again, not very tall because you can only go at that time so high in a wood structure. So amongst all of this early architecture career for Louis Sullivan is this huge fire and this need to rebuild and this need to rebuild in a different way. So I think that is a hugely important part of who Louis Sullivan is and what he created. So of that, he, um, and by the way, if anybody ever wants to go to Chicago at the location of the O'Leary building, the O'Leary um, farm, they have, that is now the Chicago Fire Academy, which is now world-class <laughs> fire academy. Um, I know firsthand how seriously they take uh, fire study there because I went to architecture school in Chicago and we had to take courses from the fire chief on fire codes. <laughs> it was no joke. But they have a sculpture of a, bra a bronze sculpture of a whirling flame right at that same. So if you're ever um, wandering through Chicago, you can try to find the Chicago fire. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, that's the big thing. I think that that fire and the early um, beginnings of tall skyscrapers in Chicago was a huge part of what made Louis Sullivan what he was and many of the other architects at that time. Um, most of you probably know that his architecture, um, he, was, he was Frank Lloyd Wright's um, uh, boss at one time. Um, they, I think, have a lot of similarity in their theories in what they how they approach designing a building. Uh, eventually, they have a very different outcome because you know they each have their own personality. But um, I think that you can see some of that same DNA in both of them. That sense of you build what you build because it's what's needed. It's, it, so we'll get more to that uh, theory when we get to the discussion of the, his famous essay, um, a tall office building uh, artistically considered. Uh, it was uh, required reading for every architecture student that I ever knew. Um, but I think that kind of gives a bit of a touch. I don't wanna get too much into the details later in his life because I don't think that really reflects what uh, the point of tonight's discussion is. But I think that kind of gives you a good grounding for where the, the fertile soil that these seeds of ideas grow out of. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Shirley. You're welcome. Um, so um, let's stay with, you know, Louis Sullivan uh, and his place in modern architecture for, for a moment. Mm. So what did he do? You know, how was, what was architecture like before him mm. and what was architecture after him? What, what, is, or what, what is it that he brought to the architecture? Um, this again comes from that need to rebuild in a different way. Um, and you'll hear if you, any of you know Frank Lloyd Wright's theories too. Um, he's taught, he talks often about wanting to build uh, an American style of architecture, something that was really true to that place and that time. Um, other architecture that was being done was really replication of previous styles. Um, Chicago was really known for the, being the second city. Um, I know that's the comedy club, but they really were the second city, New York being the first, and they kind of always had a chip on their shoulder about that. So the architects, there's an entire school of architecture called the Chicago School, 
Um, and they were really working, and Louis Selva was a big part of this, they were really working to come up with a brand new style of architecture that was wholly uniquely American that grew from the needs of the architecture um, that wasn't copying other styles just for the sake to tell everybody you knew about this building or that building or the other, you know what I mean? It wasn't a catalog duplication of other historic styles from all over the world. These were supposed to be brand new, unique materials that they were using, and they should be therefore used in a unique way. And it was a unique type of building as well. Uh, great. Let's take a few questions. Uh, folks, as I said earlier, we're doing a very systematic kind of, we're, we're proceeding very systematically because it's a very tough topic to uh, get our arms around. So at this point, we're taking questions only on life and work of Louis Sullivan. So it's going to be Marina first and then David. Marina, go ahead. And please keep your questions very short, okay? Go ahead. Uh, just a second, I need to allow you to unmute. Uh, yes, Marina, go ahead. I, I just wanted to know if he lived with his maternal or paternal grandparents. Um, who were they? I can give you their names. Um, no, no, the question was, were they maternal grandparents or paternal grandparents? Oh, gosh. You know, I think they, he may have had close relationship with both sets of grandparents. I am not sure, actually. But I think, I think in the uh, autobiography, he talks mostly about his maternal grandparents. Yeah. Uh, you know, all, all his kind of interaction, kind of very... It's it's really amazing to you know, I, I my my favorite story there is of him looking at the moon and uh, clouds going across and he's saying that you know the moon is moving and the <laughs> the grandfather says no 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 clouds are moving and he just refuses at until until he himself sees you know uh, sees you know he, he fixes his glance on the on the cloud and then he was he's able to tell. But uh, yes, uh, so next one up is David and then Ed. David, go ahead. What distinguishes uh, Wright's uh, philosophy from uh, Sullivan's? Uh, that may be um, a bigger topic than we can get into here, but um, there's a difference in style, first off. Um, and Wright's style really, changes throughout. He really almost has three different styles throughout his career. Um, I think that the kernel of the idea, their architectural theories are both fairly similar. Um, I, they're both influenced by transcendentalism at the time. Um, but this idea that form follows function is something that's really at the heart of both of theirs. Career-wise, why did Sullivan fade in his career compared to Wright, who reinvented himself uh, throughout? Um, that really is getting into the personal. There's there's another very big story there, um, and I'll just touch on it very what, briefly. What, how about this? We'll we'll deal yeah. with that towards the end. We'll uh, David, please go ahead and ask the question in the general Q and A. Uh, you know, let's first establish who Louis Sullivan is. Uh, and then we can deal with this question at that time. So please do ask at that time. Uh, Ed, you're next. Uh, yes, so how many buildings was, uh, did uh, Sullivan design? Did he, was he involved with the Wrigley building? I'm familiar with that one. And- uh, I don't think he did the, reg the Wrigley building, but between say 1880 and 1895, the firm Adler and Sullivan did more than a hundred buildings. Wow. It was huge, huge. So partially maybe to David's question is he was just burnt out. <laughs> That's possible. But no, there's uh, David's questions valid and I got an answer for it, but it really do. We do need to talk about that at the end, but it was a massive amount of building that happened. Absolutely. I mean, in, uh, sorry, go ahead, Ed. What was the most famous uh, structure would you say? 
Um, see, now I'm thinking famous or Sherry's favorite. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably the most famous would be um, what is now known as the Carson Peary Scott building, the auditory in downtown Chicago. It's one of the big department stores uh, that has this most beautiful, almost growth pattern where this carving happens. The auditorium building in Chicago um, is also probably very famous. But if you're familiar with some of the Midwest towns, smaller towns, there was a huge ton of bank buildings that he designed, all quite unique and very Sullivan-esque. And then there is one building in New York uh, that is still there in, on Bleecker uh, that, he, that he designed. Uh, next question is from uh, Donna. Donna uh, asks, uh, did Sullivan practice outside of Chicago? Um, he did early on and then um, throughout his career somewhat. But again, this gets a little bit to the David's question that towards the end of his career, he built less and less. Um, when he was working with Adler, the two of them made a really great business pairing. Um, uh, and that worked really, really well. Excellent. Um, let's see. Um, yes. Uh, so as far as buildings go, I want to say one of my favorites is the auditorium. Yeah. Uh, because it's, uh, and then there is, you know, of course, Car Carson Peary Scott. I like the building here in Bleecker simply because it is here. I can go see it whenever <laughs> I want. Uh, and I think the, uh, the Midwestern banks are very special. I have actually driven uh, to various towns uh, for hundreds of miles in order to see them. So I, I recommend them very highly. Uh, Joe, you're next. Yeah, I just want to follow on that really quickly. The function of a bank is very specific. So how did he design them so differently? Um, he did, at that time, most banks were designed like Greek temples. Um, and he made them more um like a safe they were heavy boxy but with generally this beautiful arched opening very decorated so they were a little bit like um a safe i think that's a pretty good way to describe it um, i think it's uh, somewhere between a safe and a jewel box it's yeah. something like it, it it kind of captures the feeling that it's a safe thing it's a safe thing at the same time that it is something that is holding something precious. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, because you mentioned that there were some variations. There are very uh, there are some variations in the types of banks that he designed, and mm -hmm. I was just thinking about it. How sometimes there are community banks and there are federal federal banks, and then I was just wondering what would be the different approaches that he would take. Or in since you mentioned there were so many different variations. I'm not actually sure of all the banks he did, which ones were community banks or which ones were federal banks. I'm not sure that I know, I'd have to look into that, but they all have a bank like clarity that if you see all of his buildings in a row and a bunch of pictures, you would easily be able to see which ones were banks um, because there's a, there's a similarity to them. There's a, a, a language to them. Um, that again, like Srikanth said, they are like a cross between a, a safe and a decorated jewelry box. Yeah, the, um, the, the feeling that I get when I look at his buildings is that he kind of reimagines what the function of the thing is, like what, what is a bank? And when you see it, it says, oh, that's a very unique kind of a thing. And yes, it's, it's something to kind of hold precious things safely. Mm -hmm. Or same thing about auditorium, the same thing about a department store. It has the same kind of kind of emotional feel to it. And it's not only that it is kind of designed very efficiently for that purpose, but then the kind of the emotional impact it has matches what its function is. So people feel a certain way when they are in the space or when they look, even look at a building from a distance. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, C, for 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 the links there. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I would definitely look at look at those links. Um, all right. So now we go to the second. Uh, oh, Sherry, you want to add anything, or can I go ahead? 
to my. Um, I think I saw a couple of questions early on. I didn't get a chance to read them all. No, you do, you don't need to read the questions. The okay. questions is all, all my job, and what I'm doing is that I'm calling upon people to ask okay. the questions. So you but don't need to look at the. But there was a question there that somebody asked, what were the other architects that really came oh, out of Oh, that's right. Yeah, that, that, was, that was David. Um, yeah, go so ahead. William LeBaire and Jenny is, again, more of the engineer than the architect, part of the Chicago School. Um, Adler and Sullivan, um, Burnham and Root, that's another major firm. Um, Root is especially, has some interesting um, architectural theories unfortunately died uh, rather young so we don't get to see everything uh, that may have come from him um, and there's a few others too but those I think are, to me those are the core so out of disaster comes opportunity that's what you're saying yeah yeah which is oddly what's happening right now <laughs> <laughs> all right folks um, okay so let's go to the next one um, so I will, I will start. All right. So this is very challenging. I was supposed to talk about art of expression. And then what I realized is art of expression is really the culmination of this kindergarten chats. It's the culmination of his thought because art of expression is how, how do you function? You know, what is the best way? Again, by the way, in art of expression, he doesn't mean, uh, he doesn't mean fine art. It's not about artists. It is about how a human being should create things. How should you work? What is the best way of, of creating things, no matter what field you are in? That's what he's talking about. But in order to understand the how, what I realized was that the reason, uh, I tried very hard. I, I tried up to a point where what I did was that I translated all the English into Marathi which is a language I grew up in. I did not know English till seventh grade, so I know Marathi really well. And then I translated it back from Marathi into, into English just to capture every kind of nuance, every connotation, and to see if I can put it in a more clearer terms so I could communicate it better. But I failed because I found that the core of his thought is firstly metaphysical. It's about nature of reality, nature of life, and nature of human beings. And if you don't get that, you are not going to get anything from art of expression because art of expression is all about how. And you cannot really do a proper justice to how. You cannot really grasp why he's talking about the how and how actually it works until you understand his view of human beings and what they can be. Okay. So I'm going to start with that. And today but, I think, yeah, go ahead. Before he does, I forgot. <laughs> yes, please. Um, you wanted me to give a brief um, background on what kindergarten chats is. It yes, please. Go ahead. Kindergartners. Um, Late in Sullivan's life, he wrote um, this series of essays. It was originally published, I think, 52 versions. It was, um, it was an old man thinking how to teach these young whippersnappers coming out of architecture school how, how to be architects. So he refers to it as kindergarten chat, meaning very elemental. But tongue in cheek, this is meant for um, people who have graduated with degrees in architecture. So <laughs> to give you that background. And so if you start reading it and it's feeling really, really strange, the reason is because the whole series of essays is written without telling you this, that it's a student asking questions or making comments and then the master explaining and it's a conversation. Now it never tells you that. So you have to tell which paragraph, who's talking, who's saying what as you're reading it. And as you read from the beginning towards the end of the book and these art of expression parts that Srikant's talking about come towards the end of the book is when the young whippersnapper is finally starting to get what the professor is trying to share with him. Um, so that I think is important 
um, background for what kindergarten chats is. Well, thank, thank you, Sherry. Sherry, and feel free to jump in anytime uh, to make any comments that you want. This is, this is fantastic. Okay, so, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, my purpose in this meetup is to just show you that Louis Sullivan's ideas are worth looking at. And if you are convinced about that, I put a link uh, in the meetup for his book, The Kindergarten Chats, where I would recommend you start uh, Kindergarten Chats. There is, uh, you can get it on Amazon. And there is also a link where it is now uh, not copyrighted anymore. So there is a link for free online uh, version of it as well. Yes, that's the one. Uh, so I, that's, and if I do that much, and then you kind of get I me, mean, I'm going to try to present to you his view of human being and how he thinks you can be much more than what you thought possible. Uh, and how do you actually do that? That's what the book is about. Um, if you think it is worthwhile, then I would recommend you go get the book start reading it and I will do a follow up meetups, many if necessary, to work out every detail of, of this book. That's what I want to do. But today what I want to do is I want to just show you his viewpoint. And then I'm going to, we are going to do two separate examples of applying his ideas. So you can see not only that these ideas are different, but the power of the ideas one context which has really changed the uh, how all cities look with skyscrapers and he's the father of skyscraper and he's going to talk he's going to show you how he designed core parts of the skyscraper which everybody else after that ended up using and then i'm going to talk to you about the meetups itself these meetups that we do and how those principles are used so i'm hoping that that will demonstrate that it's worth looking at this man's ideas. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do. So, as Sherry said, the context is that a pupil who has just graduated from architecture school, thinks he knows architecture, comes to Louis Sullivan to learn more about architecture. And this entire book is about unfolding in the pupil of those natural spontaneous powers which had been submerged and ignored during his academic training. The central purpose of this work of kindergarten chats is to liberate the mind from serfdom of traditions and to exhibit man's natural powers in their creative capabilities when expanding in the open air and spirit of responsible freedom, in other words, the true spirit of democracy, from which follows that operation of the historical feudal mind and the advancement of democratic mind uh, that is placed in sharp, sharp contrast. So what he's saying is that it's, um, he's saying that most people's view of what a human being can be is far from what a human being is. And all he's doing is that he's removing all kinds of misconceptions, which are part of the culture and part of education and parts of habit that people have so that you can exercise all your powers as a human being and function fully as a human being. And he shows you what is it that is stopping you and how can you overcome that? Now, if you, you know, I always like to do syntopical comparisons of ideas. So this is the same idea of Carl Jung when he talks about the self. He says that, you know, people, think only what they are conscious of is self. They don't realize the full entirety of what is possible. Um, this is the same idea in, in Hinduism uh, of trying, which holds that the God is within you. And it is all about 
not getting distracted by what is going on around you so you can go to your core and act from your core so this is this is this is the same idea um now louis sullivan is an artist as sherry was pointing out to me a moment ago uh, he's an artist so he presents everything as a poet full of metaphors so you need to kind of learn how to take in for for example for me that's very natural uh you know i'm a very visual person i'm i love metaphors and i grasp things so for people who are not used to getting taking in information that way it is hard many times when people are breaking new grounds um they are artists like people like michelangelo of sh who showed what human being can be you know coming out of the middle ages people thought that you know human beings were was this abject creature and there you have david now he would not be able to put in words exactly but he was able to show it so it is similar phenomena here that he is he is presenting it to you so what i'm going to do is that i'm going to read a bunch of paragraphs very short paragraphs and we will discuss them and sherry feel free to jump in so the first thing is the purpose of this book is to liberate your mind from traditions that are stopping you um the second point i want to make is the main theme of of his which is form follows function so which is kind of which is about kind of nature of life and then i want to culminate with uh two points one about nature of man what does it mean about nature of man and then what he says about thinking you know what what is actually thinking um and that's where i'm going to stop so it basically lays out his view of life human beings and what is possible to human beings okay and then we will go directly into applications of that all right so i'm going to start with uh let me see give me a second all right so he's talking about I me mean, his core idea is form follows function okay um that's it uh he is he has written an autobiography called autobiography of an idea so he says look that's the only idea i have one okay and what does that mean that means that all his observations he has drank in all of life in all its complexity all its ups and downs all its variability all its detail all its large vistas and he's kind of boiled it down to this one idea and then he engages life he does things using that idea so it's like a if you can imagine it's like taking the whole and bringing it together on this one point and then diverging out from that and that is the core of his thought so if you get that you get everything that he's saying if you don't get that you don't get anything okay so that that's that's what it is now what is this idea so i'm going to describe it in about seven or eight different ways seven or different as uh, seven or eight different aspects and maybe some of these will resonate with you okay so first one is that the initiating pressure of a living force and the resulting structure or mechanism whereby such invisible force is made manifest and operative so the pressure this in, invisible pressure of living force we call function okay. and the resultant form the structure that is formed and structure through which it is carried out is called form okay hence the law of function and form are discernible through nature so another way of looking at it is that there is outer outward appearances of things that's the structure most people are enamored by that most people think only in terms of that when you are trying to identify function of something you're trying to see what is the living force that is creating that structure okay that's when you're focused on the function um let me put it a couple more different ways this i'm using his words and then i'm going to talk a little bit more about each of them 
okay the, this is one of the most simplest and uh, you know astonishing things he says a thing looks like what it is and vice versa it is what it looks like outward appearances resemble inner purposes so it's a way of saying that when you see something don't just stick with that don't just focus on the forms always instead of just saying what is so another way of looking at it is that the form is what is it as you're seeing it function is why is it the way it is what is driving it what is the what is the living force that is creating it okay so that's so it is outer appearance and inner inner purpose that distinction uh, another way of putting it would be uh, let me take um, what would be a good let me take this one next okay see an another one of the sentences i like very much is just as every form contains its function and exists by the virtue of it so every function finds or is engaged in finding its form so you can come at it from both sides when you're trying to understand form or function when you see something you say how did it come to be now it could be anything it could be something that you made it could be something in society um different structures of the society it could be the words that you are using it would be the way you are moving so any form you can always say just every form contains its function and exists by the virtue of it so what is it what is the living force that is supporting it what is it what is it that created it what is it that is keeping it going instead of looking at just the outward appearances so it is a way of getting at the core of the thing why so or so every function finds or is engaged in finding its form so a true function is always trying to find its form because in order to manifest itself in order to live it has to create the structure that will allow it to live um now there is all kinds of things going on where people pretending to have forms and different functions and stuff like that so that's why he says you know look at it very carefully don't look at the words that are being said about it ask yourself what is actually going on and that's what it means to kind of remain focused on the functions um let me do one more a uh, couple more things to show how i want to show you how complex this entire dance is it says functions are born of functions and in turn give birth to and death to others forms emerge from forms and others arise and descend from these all are related interwoven intermeshed interconnected interblended they sway and swirl and mix and drift interminably they shape they reform they dissipate they respond correspond attract repel coalesce disappear reappear merge and emerge slowly or shiftly gently or with cataclysmic force from chaos into chaos from death into life from life into death from rest into motion from motion into rest from darkness into light from light into darkness from sorrow into joy from joy into sorrow from purity into foulness from foulness into purity from growth into decadence from decadence into growth all is form all is function ceaselessly unfolding and infolding and heart of man unfolds and infolds with them so this is one of the things that is there so it's like it's a simple idea but it is like a fractal idea it is the core which subdivides uh in a very complex way and it combines with others um and this is both at the function level and at the form level um so this is uh, so this is very much um you know how how he thinks of it the the, the complexity of it um i want to look at 
couple more things here. Uh, 47, age 47, age 47. All right, so another one of his concepts connected with it is this his concept of organic. Organic means something that is true to its function. So functions produce sub-functions which support the function. Um, and they have the same kind of shape, same kind of quality to it. So everything looks integrated everything operates in an integrated way. This is opposed to people kind of borrowing pieces of their soul and kind of putting them all together um, like a mishmash of things um, versus organic. So this is another way of um, looking at it. I just want to see how we are doing on time. All right, we are a little bit behind. So I'm going to now look at um, his view of human beings. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about thinking, and then we will go to specific examples. Okay. All right. So he's asking, what are the characteristics of a real architect? This pupil asks him. This is, and the answer that he gives is actually not about architects. He says, what is the characteristics of a real human being? Okay. He's saying, first of all, poetic imagination. Second, a broad sympathy, a humane character, common sense, and a thoroughly disciplined mind. Third, a perfected technique. And finally, an abundance and gracious gift of expression. We see a human being as active, alert, supple, strong, and sane. A generative man. A man having five senses all awake. Eyes that fully see. Ears that are attuned to every sound and nuance. A man living in his present, knowing and feeling the vibrancy of that ever moving movement with heart to draw it in and mind to put it out. The incessant, that incessant, that portentous birth, that fertile moment, which we call today. As a man who knows his day, who loves his day, who knows and loves the exercise of life, who rightly values strength and kindliness, whose feet are on the earth, whose brain is keyed to the ceaseless song of his kind, who sees the past with kindly eye, who sees the future in a kindling vision as a man who wills to create. So shall our art be, for to live Hold with, holy to live is the manifest consummation of existence. So that's what he thinks a man is. Okay, not what he could be, but that's what it, he is. You know, that, that's what you are. There are things that are stopping you from being fully that. Now, I want to take a moment to give you his thoughts about thinking. Just to give you, he has such comments about memory, about imagination, about courage, about, about many, many different topics. But I just want to show you one example of how he thinks about things. And the topic, that example that I've chosen is on thinking. Okay, so I'm just going to read out In passing, I may say that real thinking is better done without words than with them. And creative thing must be done without words. When the mind is active and vitally at work for its own creative uses, it has no time for word building. Words are too clumsy. You have no time to select and group them. Hence, you must think 
in terms of images, of pictures, of states of feelings, of rhythm, the well-trained, well-organized, well-disciplined mind works with remarkable rapid rapidity and luminous intensity. It will body forth combinations in mass so complex, so far reaching that you could not write them down in years. Uh, writing is but the slow snail-like creeping of words, climbing laboriously. Okay, um, I want to show you what he thinks. Uh, I, I want to talk to you about um, what he means about thinking in the present. He says, but the reality is off and in by, okay, the reality is off in, by, and for the present, and the present only. Bear this strictly in mind. It is highly important. It must lie at the very root of your new education, for it is with the present only that you are in physical vital contact. And I have told you that real thoughts, vital thoughts, is born of physical senses. It is in the present only that you really live. Therefore, it is in the present only that you can really think. And in this sense, you think organically. The present is the organic moment, the living moment. The past and future do not exist. One is dead and the other unborn. The present is a twinkling of eye that separates death from life as time moves on. But thought is quicker than twinkling of eye. The first thing, now this is, he's asking, you know, what, what do I need to do? So he says, the first thing upon which you must bend your mind is to learn to think seriously, accurately, methodically, persistently, thoroughly, and fearlessly. Never doubt the power of your own mind, for they are there, waiting for you to discover them, to know them, to use them. You will not learn in printed books how to think this way, but you will find it in the great open book of life about you. It is there waiting for you to discover, to know it, and to use it. And I want to close here on the thinking, and then I just have one more comment. So after, after Sullivan explains all of this, the pupil is a little disheartened. He says, you have set me a terrible task. I feel, I feel discouraged from attempting it when he talks to him about thinking. He says, nothing of the sort, Sullivan says. The more you think, more you will delight in thinking. And the more you contemplate, the more you will delight in contemplation. The more you act, more you will delight in action, little by little, I'll suggest to you how to think, how to express your thoughts. Meanwhile, bear in mind, you are not to think merely on occasions as some sort of ceremonial way, but daily, hourly, all the time. It must become your fixed and natural habit of mind. So will, you, so will your thinking steadily grow in power, clearness, flexibility and grace, and you will ever thereafter feel the spirit of, of independence and self-control um, as it truly means. Um, I want to close with this quote of Sullivan about children. Um, he says, let us remain children as we grow old. For I tell you, if you kill a child, kill the child in man, you kill the man in man. No truer saying was ever said than this. The child is father to the man. So recall to your heart, your childhood, which is looking at you with wistful eye and not so far away. So what he's saying is that this is all within you and it's all about kind of recalling it back and starting out. So that's what his whole 
approaches. Now, I don't know, uh, I think we can, Sherry, are you there? Yes. Okay, so um, let's take a few questions. Uh, Sherry, you want to add anything? All I want to add there is what a poet, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I think honestly, he felt at the end of his life, he was more of a poet than an architect, that just sometimes his poetry was buildings. Yes. Okay, now let me see a uh, question. So uh, Jackie, you had a question. Go ahead. Uh, Jackie, you can go ahead and just. Oh yeah, I had um, put it in the chat. Let me find it again. I'm so sorry. I didn't expect to get called on. Okay, uh, uh, folks, so when you put something in chat, I'll simply call on you and then you I can oh, ask the question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was curious if, uh, I, I didn't read it at all. I kind of perused it before. How does he further define living force? I, you know, it's, it's a, you know, do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Living force, uh, that can be really interpreted in many different ways. I feel obviously there's transcendentalism. I feel spirituality in that. I feel naturalness, many things with that term. What's your thoughts on that? Sure. So what he would say is as follows. He says, don't look at it this way. He says, try to look at life, try to take in life, try to observe life. Spend your time doing that so that you get attuned to how life works, how, what its rhythms are what its patterns are, how interaction works in life. And when you actually grasp that of how it is functioning, then you would have some sense of what it is. That's how he approaches it. It's a profoundly mm -hmm. inductive discipline. Uh, next yeah. question is by, let me see. Uh, who, let, okay, I'm kind of lost track of questions here. Give me a second. Uh, yes, uh, Marjorie. Marjorie, go ahead. Uh, yes. So in listening to you, I must say my background is taking complex thoughts and writing them in a way that people understand. Mm -hmm. So when I listened in the beginning and you were talking about design and form and function, my mind was obsessed with all of the bad design that exists. <laughs> I mean, not only the bad design. So, you know, you're telling people to look at design and the function comes out. It's sort of idealistic. And apparently there was even a book that I think I, was recommended by the Center for Inquiry that I bought about how even in nature, all the things that are wrong with us, where the function, the form does not support the function. So I get kind of stuck there uh, when you're talking about all of that with Got it. all the things running through my mind that are wrong with form and function in, in nature and in design in general, especially. Okay, let's, uh, can we respond? Okay, yeah. uh, Sherry, you want to go first? Um, Solomon was very, if you read all of his work, you find some incredibly hilarious, biting responses to other buildings. Um, he didn't want you to think that people other than his and people who followed in his sort of mindset, uh, those buildings, not the other buildings. <laughs> but no, his, um, if, if for no other reason, if you're interested in architecture and architectural history, his reviews of other buildings are worth reading more than anything else. But you're right, there's lots of um, bad design, especially in architecture. <laughs> but what, but, but what uh, uh, can, I, can I say something? Uh, yeah, what quick. I'm saying here is I think something that interferes with him communicating with people is he says, look at function, look at form, this is what happens. And that's not true. It's ideally, you know, this would happen. Uh, Marjorie, can we respond? Okay, let, let's not do follow-ups because I want to give as many people chance to talk because this is like, you have only few chances here. So let me go ahead and respond to it okay. and then we'll go to the next person, okay? All right, um, so firstly, I would say that Sullivan holds that most of the forms 
are terrible because they are actually not forms of what they say they are. People are actually trying to do something very different. Um, so when you're trying to build a building, they're actually not trying to build a building. They are trying to, let's say, impress people. They are trying to pretend that they know what is going on, something like that. So most of the designs are based, I mean, they, they would say, he says that they're the function and form or kind of purported function and forms do not match. So the function must be something very different. And then it's all about finding out what the function is. So I would agree that there is a lot of forms out there, most of the forms, which are terrible because most of the functions are terrible. And so it's all about saying, what is it that is there? And in terms of the forms in evolution, typically the context in which this happens is that when some function, like for example, in upright posture, upright posture gives so much benefit for human beings that some small things, some things which are relatively small in terms of impact on you, those designs don't get optimized because the top, like for example, stability of the lower back gets a thing. But that's, that's a, you know, that's, that's a detail. Um, so I'm going to go with uh, Sanjay next. Sanjay, go ahead. Yes, um, so I, I, um, I agree that uh, what, he's, what Sullivan's talking about is is integrating the form and function together. And that um, to make things, uh, to design things, um, uh, you want to have them um, follow each other. Now, there's a question that I have because I think, I mean, in, in general, it's very difficult to do this. And, and obviously he understood this, but the, the, the question I have is, is it true that a form will always have function and that a function can always be realized in a real form. That's part of my question, but at the same time, I also have this other side of it, which I'm wondering, maybe I'm, I'm looking at it incorrectly, that, that maybe what he's saying is that given a form and a function, you know, as a pair, um, it's up to the artists or the architect, in this case, architect's role to find out how to make th that happen. And I'm not sure which okay. what he's saying. Okay, Let, let's, do, let's do one thing. This is, this was the most abstract thing uh, from this entire presentation. What we're going to do next is basically showing how these principles or this form and function apply to two concrete examples. One, design of skyscraper, which he did, and second, on to these meetups uh, that we've been doing. So I want to, and let's take questions after both those um, both those ap applications. So maybe hopefully things will become clearer uh, with that. Um, so uh, Sherry, take it away with, uh, with the next part. Okay. So um, I believe my favorite uh, essay of Louis Sullivan's is his essay titled The Tall Office Building, Artistically Considered. Um, and this is my copy of it when I was an early architecture student you can see it got heavily highlighted. <laughs> so um, it was a big impact on me. So for those of you who didn't get a chance to read this entire essay, I'm just gonna read about four or five paragraphs of this that will, I think gives you a really great explanation of how Louis Sullivan used this idea himself in his own work. And I think that really helps clarify a lot of this. So here we go. Let us state the conditions in the plainest manner. Briefly, they are these. Offices are necessary for the transaction of business. The invention and perfection of the high-speed elevators make vertical travel that was once tedious and painful, now easy and comfortable. Development of steel manufacture has shown the way to safe, rigid, economical constructions rising to great heights. Continued growth of the population in great cities, consequent congestion of its centers and rise in value of ground, stimulate an increase in the number of stories. These successfully piled one on top of the other, react on ground values and so on by action and reaction, interaction and interreaction. Thus has come about 
that form of lofty construction called the modern office building. It has come in answer to a call for it, for in it a new grouping of social conditions has found a habitation and a name. And then I'm gonna jump forward and he states, it is my belief that it is one of the very essence of every problem that it contains and suggests its own solution. I, this, this I believe to be natural law. Let's examine then carefully the elements. Let us search out this contained suggestion, this essence of the problem. And then he goes on to describe an office building. And he says, wanted first, a story below ground containing boilers, engines of various sorts, etc. In short, the plant for power, heating, lighting, etc. And a ground floor, so called, devoted to stores, banks, or other establishments requiring large area, ample space, ample light, and great freedom of access. Third, a second story. By, the, by now, you should all start picturing the latest skyscraper that you've been in, right? Um, third, a second story readily accessible by stairways. This space, usually in large subdivisions, corresponding liberally in its structural spacing and expanse of glass and breadth of external openings. Fourth, above this, an infinite number of stories of offices piled tier upon tier, one tier just like another tier, one office just like all the other offices, an office being similar to a cell in a honeycomb, merely a compartment. Fifth and last, at the top of this pile is placed a space or a story that, as related to the life and usefulness of the structure, is purely physiological in its nature, namely the attic. In this, the circulatory system completes itself and makes its grand turn. In ascending and descending, the space is filled with pipes and tanks, valves, sheaves, and mechanical, etc., that supplement and complement the force originating plant hidden below ground in the cellar. Finally, or at the beginning rather, there must be on the ground floor a main aperture or entrance common to all the occupants or patrons of the building. Then, he goes on to say, he goes on to describe how to give, you know, how that the entrance needs to attract the eye to its location. Uh, the remainder of the stories treated more or less the same way. Um, and he talks a little bit about how that would be. Then I'll jump forward here. Um, but after all of that, he says, but our building may have all these at, in a considerable degree and yet be far from an adequate solution of the problem I am attempting to define. We must now heed the imperative voice of emotion. So there you have your poet coming back. And he says, this is my favorite part of an office building. It must be tall, every inch of it tall. The force and power of altitude must be in it. The glory and pride of exultation must be in it. It must be every inch a proud and soaring thing, rising in sheer exultation, that from the bottom to the top, it is a unit without a single dissenting line. And then later he goes on to say, all things in nature have a shape, that is to say a form an outward semblance that tells us what they are, that distinguishes them from ourselves and each other. It seems ever as though the life and the form were absolutely one and inseparable. So adequate is the sense of its fulfillment. Whether it be the sweeping eagle in his flight or the open apple blossom, the toiling workhorse, the blithe swan, the branching oak, the winding stream at its base, the drifting clouds all over all the coursing sun, form ever follows function, and it is the law 
where function does not change, form does not change. The granite rocks, the ever brooding hills remain for ages and the lightning lives, comes into shape and dies in a twinkling. It is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, and of the soul, that the life is recognizable in the expression that the form ever, ever follows the function. And that is, I think, his best example of how he puts his own ideas um, to work in his very own work. Okay, uh, let's, let's take some more questions. Um, so anybody who has question, you can just go ahead and type in uh, exclamation mark. I'm very eager to see, you know, how much kind of is getting through. Um, and what we're going to do is that then we're going to go ahead and do the, um, you know, take uh, takeaways. So I want to get a sense of what is it that you, you, you got so far. So Mike, go ahead. Oh, just a second. I need to unmute everybody. Yes, uh, Mike, go ahead. Uh, Mike, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, let me see, Mike, we can't stay, we can't hear you yet. Let me see if I can find you. Uh, got yes, it, go okay. Yeah. There we go. Uh, I saw, I've learned about um, Louis Sullivan through the eyes of uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, having originally started in Chicago, although I'm about 19 times removed from Chicago. Um, and uh, I got the impression that uh, there was a similar relationship between um, uh, uh, Louis Sullivan and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright as to uh, the relationship between Tesla and Edison. And uh, it was sort of uh, both friendly and adversarial at different times. And... Uh, and uh, um, uh, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was eventually fired from that organization and uh, then uh, started out, um, uh, uh, then became intensely productive on his own. Uh, I also, uh, uh, and these are fragments, uh, the other fragment is uh, Ayn Rand's story about the Fountainhead is uh, variously thought as being uh, the story of Burnham, the story of uh, uh, Sullivan, or the story of Frank Lloyd Wright, all of three of which had rather colorful lives. They were uh, both marketeers and uh, uh, engineers and creative, uh, and creative in all those areas. Mm -hmm. And they all lived at, on, the, on the fringes of economic disaster. Uh, any comments on uh, how that all fits together? Because I only know the pieces, mm -hmm. having read Fountainhead and admired it, but uh, still not understood it. Um, yes, I can. I can take that first um, to get to your comment about uh, Wright and Sullivan. Um, Wright worked for Sullivan, and the bad blood that came between the two of them. I think they always deeply respected one another after that. But what happened is that Wright was taking clients, um, moonlighting clients, uh, which is a, a pretty massive no-no. Um, he could have brought those clients to Sullivan and uh, worked on them as a part of the firm. And I'm sure Sullivan would have gladly done a, that. that would have, that's a very common thing to have done. But so he got himself, uh, Wright got himself in a little bit of hot water um, by, by moonlighting, uh, that's really where that comes from. Um, but on to your, uh, discussion of, um, any relationship between Burnham and Root and Wright and Sullivan and Ayn Rand's, uh, work, The Fountainhead, um, that is, uh, 
project I am currently working on, so I can't get into too much detail about my part of the project, but I can tell you that um, there is architectural history here that she was inspired from. She very explicitly um, told Wright, she contacted Wright before the book was written or attempted to contact. Eventually she got in touch with them after. Um, but she, in those early letters before the book was published, told him directly that this is not a story of you, um, but that you are somebody who I think would understand it because you're somebody who's, um, you know, of the same inspiration, of the same mindset. So she wasn't, um, she was certainly inspired uh, by this, this history that was happening at the time um, because that really was this, this question of how do we build. Um, it was a real valid thing that was happening at that moment of history. Um, but was she lifting stories? Uh, not directly, like any fiction writer she was inspired by. Um, but there is a future project, uh, I don't know how long down the road, that gets into much more detail of that. Maybe someday we'll, we can do that instead. Sure, I, I will just do, uh, I'll just add one more thing. So the ideas, architectural ideas of Howard Rock are Louis Sullivan's ideas, or the, the idea of form follows function, which is, you know, his whole approach in, uh, you know, in, in Fountainhead that is, that that idea comes from, you know, our idea comes from Louis Sullivan. Um, how about, uh, Sherry, how about we take uh, David's question about why was it that Frank Lloyd Wright was successful and Louis Sullivan was not? Go ahead. Um, let me go back and say it wasn't just um, Howard Rourke's architectural theories are Ayn Rand's distillation um, uh, and philosophical tinkering with um, this idea of form follows function, but it also comes from William LeBaron and Jenny. It comes from Root. It comes from Burr. It comes from a lot of things that were happening at that time. So I'm sorry, Shri Khan, I'm gonna correct you on that one. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> so, anytime, anytime. What was the other question? Uh, so that uh, the uh, other question was uh, the original question that David asked, that uh, why is mm. it that Frank Lloyd Wright was successful at a time where uh, Louis Sullivan was not, um, towards the end of his career, end of- Yeah, Frank Lloyd Wright spent an awful lot of his career um, at the brink of financial disaster too. Um, and that has a lot to do with um, his own personal finances, his own choices in life. Um, but he also had, um, so I wouldn't go so far as to say that Wright had success where Sullivan didn't. Uh, they both had disasters in many ways. Um, and writes sometimes, I mean, he had almost like three separate careers and sometimes writes uh, dilemmas were because of his personal life uh, boiled over into the press and uh, turned people, frankly, just turned people off and they wouldn't hire him. Uh, but eventually time would go by and then he became, it's like a whole section of his career. With Sullivan, um, from the 19, from the fire that happened in 1871, to the World's Fair in Chicago. Um, well, I think it was like 22 years later, something like that. Um, Chicago had rebuilt itself so much. So you have to really understand uh, Sullivan was hugely successful at the time. Um, but during that World's Fair, Chicago had been spending all that time growing its own architecture, its own style of architecture, and there's books about this, about the white city. Um, the, there was a push um, to bring in um, um, a whole bunch of architects from New York City, McKinn, Mead and White for one, which were very historical architects and to design this massive um, temporary city, that's what a World's Fair city was, to do this whole entire city um, in this classicism style. And of course, this is very much at the, against the very core of what was happening in Chicago in the last 22 years 
and the core of what Sullivan and so many others in Chicago were fighting for. And there was quite a brouhaha. Um, and eventually Sullivan was um, granted permission to design one building, the transportation building. Um, my earrings, I don't know if anybody can see them. They are, oh, I don't know. You probably can't see them. Yeah. They are um, the uh, ornament detail of the transportation building. Of course, all of those buildings were temporary, so they're no longer there. Um, although part of the archway is par uh, part of the Chicago Art Museum. So this whole brouhaha happens and this development, this kernel that was growing and making an impact. And one of the things I didn't mention earlier is this ideas ended up inspiring architects all around the world, eventually coming back to the US as international modern style and modern style from all over all of these ideas went out into the world but where they didn't take hold is right in chicago and that really kind of broke him um, so by the end of his life he was a bitter angry man um, living in a seedy hotel um, and that's sadly uh, how his life ended uh, Sorry but, about the downer. Uh, but you have to say that you'd also to kind of complete the thing is that that is the time when he wrote Kindergarten Chats. Yes, it is. Autobi autobiography of an idea yeah. and a system of architectural ornaments, which yeah. are the three things which really kind of capture the core of his thought because before that he had not written that much. And we would so really- Some essays, but- it, Yeah, but nothing of that scale, it, right? Of, yeah, of no. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that um, became his time to write, his time yes. to get all of his ideas down on paper. And honestly, um, they have been, um, I mean, think of where they've gone. They went to Frank Lloyd Wright, they went to multiple architects overseas, came back to the US um, just before World War II when all of the Bauhaus uh, professors left because they didn't want to get captured by the Nazis. Uh, Gropius and Mies van der Rohe, all of them, um, Louis Kahn, I mean, they all they started architecture schools all across the U.S. And those kernels of ideas really formed all those architectural schools. And then on top of it, um, those kernels of ideas went um, inspiring Ayn Rand to write The Fountainhead, which I think now 50 years, no, I guess it's Atlas Shrugged that's 50 years later, still still on the bestseller list, but it's a huge bestseller. Um, I believe every single architecture student has probably read it. I, I, I found myself, strangely, the only one who hadn't when uh -huh. I was in, I think, the second year of architecture school, second, third year. Uh -huh. I was the only one who hadn't uh -huh. read it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, very powerful. His ideas have really succeeded, but I don't know that he ever saw that. Mm -hmm. Next one up is it's going to be Paul, Marina, and Dave next. Uh, Paul, go ahead. Uh, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work, I'm working on it. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I hope that I won't uh, disappoint you. I'm really glad that you uh, brought. Uh, Louis Sullivan, which I knew a little bit about before because I am involved with um, design. I'm building houses, fortunately. I am well off, reasonably well off now. I can design what I want and build what I want, and then I am selling it afterwards. Nice. And I am definitely much more influenced by Lloyd by, by Wright because his uh, mainly his Pennsylvania houses, I think the the best ever built, built the nicest building, private building ever built. You know, I know, I know that it was built in the 30s, but it is unbelievable. And that's what I would call that it's organic building because it's perfectly, perfectly designed into the, into the atmosphere and in, into the nature, much more than than uh, Louis Sullivan ever produced. I like his buildings a lot. Uh, in my hometown, in middle of Europe, uh, the, the, the department store was basically designed uh, according to him. It was only seven stories, but, but for middle Europe, it was a lot. 
uh, but it was completely designed by by his school. You know, uh, it's Breda Weinstein Building in uh, in Opava, which is uh, in Ch former Czechoslovakia, and I, I knew I knew that it was in his style when I was still there in school, and, and I live in Canada. But I'm definitely much more influenced by Paul Wright and by uh, uh, Colbert not so much, but right, especially that, that, that is something what I, what I didn't know, honestly, that Sullivan was writing so much, and I have to, uh, and you gave me the idea to, that I have to definitely read more about him mm -hmm. than, I, than I used to. And uh, the connection with Ayn Rand, uh, Rand which, uh, which is unbelievable, certainly, because that's one of my favorite authors. It's, um, I am really glad that you came with this idea, and I didn't know that you are so much in So thank you for that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Don't, sorry for my accent. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Paul, uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, John uh, Roth, do you want to comment on your take on Sullivan? I can give you five minutes to talk about whatever you would like to say. Yeah, well, there's a lot that could be said, and uh, so I'm not going to try to say it all. Um, I lived in Chicago uh, for uh, between 10 and 15 years on and off. And so, of course, I was quite familiar with Lewis Sullivan and uh, and many of the other very fine, impressive um, architectural works of that era in downtown Chicago. Um, over the years, um, I, I had a, a big place and I had any number of roommates. And it happened at one point that one of my roommates was uh, the director of concessions for the auditorium theater, which had been completely renovated and updated. And, uh, and the, the uh, group that ran the auditorium theater at that point wanted to make it into the premier dance theater of Chicago. Uh, and so because I had this friend who was director of concessions, I could sneak in mm -hmm. an hour early with the concession crew for free and, and watch the Moscow Ballet, the American Ballet, Alvin Ailey, everything at the Auditorium Theater. And, and when you think of it, that this thing was built 100 years ago and it still is stunning mm -hmm. in its effect, that, that touches something that is is somehow very important. And, and it, it's a very wonderful place and a very wonderful place to experience still. The other thing that I would say, um, not wanting to carry on too much, is Sullivan was exceptional in that he wanted to somehow um, formulate these very, very complex philosophical and metaphysical ideas. And, and I think that that was quite unusual at the time. And even though some people kind of make grand manifestos, um, Le Corbusier had manifestos, Frank Lloyd Wright had manifestos, but I, I'm hard pressed to think of one that is as, as deeply uh, philosophical, and I would say even spiritual in nature, as Lewis Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I'd say at this point in time is it's very much out of fashion. And, and I'm hard pressed to think of, of an architecture convention or an architecture meeting or an architecture society where I can think of contemporary architects who who say and behave in this manner. Um, we, we could probably name one or two in the last 50 or 60 years, but I'm not aware of anyone working right now that I would put in that category. That's enough, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, Sherry, you want to say anything? Um, you make me miss Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember, uh, so, sorry, go ahead, Sherry. Um, Srikant and I, um, well, actually, did we live in Chicago at the same time? Yes, for about, yeah. I think, six months or a year, a year yeah, or so. Yeah, but um, I met my husband. I went to architecture school in Chicago, met my husband there, um, lived there, again, about the same, about 10 or so years. Um, 
uh, and there's many great things. I actually think Chicago has a more interesting skyline um, because they experimented so much with architecture. Um, they had a sense, you could follow essentially architectural history by walking around. I used to give architectural tours of um, buildings in Chicago. Um, they usually went long and <laughs> they were small tours privately organized and sometimes we ended up taking the whole afternoon and we'd see like four buildings. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah I, I want to say that uh, auditorium has always been my favorite because like when you walk in that space, mm -hmm. you know, when you are in that space, it's like it is a theater in a way where you say, wait a minute, why aren't, why have I not been in the theater before? It's kind of like, you know, kind of theater magnified because it has kind of, it has removed all the artificial things. It's just this amazing space mm -hmm. where, which is all designed in every detail, in every kind of feeling mm -hmm. to saying that, okay, this is a place to kind of showcase this on the stage so people can experience it from here. And it's like a grand experience just being there. Yeah. It's like you feel that a spectacle is taking place by just you being there. And uh, they do, they, they have tours. Now, I'm not sure if I can remember the tours that I had as an architecture student because we got backstage passes to everything. We got to go everywhere essentially, which was a treat. Um, but I think I've also been on just a theater tour where they take, most theaters do this um, during their off hours um, where you can go and get a tour of the theater. They'll show you the backstage. They show you up in the balcony. It's a great way. If you want to pick out your favorite seat for a performance, you can really kind of tour every single part. Somebody just put a tour link there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so the next one up is, uh, it's gonna be Marina, Dave, and Anne next. Marina, go ahead. I understand that you doing somebody who is uh, being um, a prototype for Anne Rand, since you're totally not Randian, but thank you anyway. My question is, um, have, did, did Anne ever met him? Or what was the intersections, if any? Um, you mean between Ayn Rand and um, Louis Sullivan? Sullivan? Yeah. Um, when Ayn Rand started doing her research for the Fountainhead, um, I believe that Louis Sullivan had already passed away um, by that point. He died in the 20s. Um, so I don't think she ever met him, but she did research. So I'm sure um, that uh, she was aware of him. Um, she lived for a while in Chicago. Um, so I'm sure that's part of uh, her background, so just part of the, the amount of research that she did. So did she meet Next. Lloyd Wright? She did. Um, she met Frank Lloyd Wright on a couple of occasions, um, not until after she had tried um, quite earnestly to get an interview uh, with him before her book was published, The Fountainhead was published. Um, but there's several letters between the two of them. Um, they spent some time together and she eventually hired him to design a building, a house for her and her husband, um, but they never built it. They ended up staying in New York City. Okay, next up is uh, Dave. Dave, go ahead. Thanks very much, Shikana, and the great presentation. I uh, snuck away and looked at the bank buildings. It seemed to me that these good designs are subliminal. They're talking to the subconscious. And the, a bank is not a big building, but because of the simplicity of the design and they cut out the archway or whatever, they seem larger. They seem imposing. And I can see the security and then the to make it uh, very ornamental that, uh, yeah, to me, that's the uh, thing about, oh, and, they, and then the skyscrapers uh, going straight up, it looks like they're, you know, ready to take off. It's just <laughs> everything, you just it's speaking to the, to the sun. Yeah, and, and you can see that really his, um, you know, he talks about this in, in tall office building that the entrance needs to have something that catches the eye. 
And so if you think about a, a painter or a sculptor, they will use texture or contrast of some sort to draw your eye through the work of art. Well, that's exactly what he's doing if you look at his banks. You cannot miss that entrance. That's just not possible unless, of course, you don't have the sense of sight. Uh, the other thing I would say is that, I mean, the, the point, Dave, the point that you're making, that it actually speaks to you at a subconscious level. Um, I think that's profoundly true. And that's, that's by design. That's, uh, that's by design for him throughout. So what he's trying to do is that he's first doing the function design. So he's saying, okay, what, what does the building need to do? What, when, you, when he's designing anything, he's kind of working all of that out. Then at the final stage, He's saying, what is the proper emotional lead motive of this thing, which matches what this building is to do? So for example, if you're designing a house, what is the lead motive of an office? What is the lead motive of a kitchen? And it must feel that way. Um, and that he builds a whole bunch of things built, you know, he builds that on the top of it. Um, so very much so. Um, next one is by Anne. Anne, go ahead. Uh, Anne, you need to unmute yourself. I, okay, uh, Anne, go ahead. I've unmuted you. Okay, uh, Anne, let me, okay, let me read out the question. Would it be, uh, so this is for you, uh, Shari. Would it be fair to say that as Sullivan's vision was vertical, Frank Lloyd's mm -hmm. evolved a on the horizontal plane? Uh, Anne, can you speak? No, your audio is not working very well. Okay. All right, so th that's the question about vertical uh, and horizontal. Um, and that's actually pretty, pretty interesting because, um, and this kind of gets back to a couple of other questions earlier on about the differences between Sullivan and, and Wright. Um, and you have to take a look when you're looking at their bodies of work. Most of what Sullivan built was in the city. Most of what Frank Lloyd Wright built was in the country. And that's why one is primarily horizontal and the other is primarily vertical. And it really gets down to form follows function for both of them. Um, there are skyscrapers that Frank Lloyd Wright designed. Um, they are very tall. They're every inch of it tall. Um, but it wasn't that common that he was building skyscrapers. It was much more common than he was building houses. Uh, okay, folks, it's getting a little late. So what I want to do is I want to now go directly to takeaways. Uh, I want to see what uh, what you got from this presentation. So I'm just going to uh, call on people in the order in which I see them. And you can spend up to two minutes talking about what you got uh, from the presentation. So let's start with, um, let me see, uh, Oksana. Uh, I, Dave, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Sherry. I just want to say, if anybody's got other questions and want to stay at the end, we can do that too. Yeah, no. What, what I want to do is that uh, what we'll do is that let's hear all the um, all the takeaways. Mm -hmm. Let's look at uh, patterns in them, and then we will get to you know we'll we'll address them directly. We'll not address them as they are, you know, as they're saying it, but we'll look at the patterns and then go back and maybe open it up to questions again. Okay. All right, folks. Um, so uh, next up is uh, Oksana uh, and uh, Dave. Go ahead, Oksana. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for the presentation. I live in Chicago, mm -hmm. so it's um, not not for a long time, but I'm still learning. Um, um, I, to me, the, my takeaway is I definitely want to read more. I want to read this. Um, the essays and uh, the poetry to me is um, just very special. I can't explain, but uh, beautiful and warm and um, definitely something that I want to read more and uh, process more. So that's my, my take in general. 
Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Uh, Thank next up is uh, Donald, uh, Donna, and Marisa. Donald, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Donald, and I, I'm a speech therapist, and I, I work in the New York City Public Schools. And I've been thinking about how I dress. And I dressed last year to impress my principal. And uh, I didn't get along with the fourth or fifth grade boys. So I think I might come in with the Black Lives Matters t-shirt uh, the first day of school and probably wear some basketball players' faces on my t-shirts. And I think I might have the form function thing a little bit better and uh, develop more rapport. I think they're afraid to associate even with me, let alone uh -huh. invest in my lessons. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Donna, Marisa, and Lisa. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, uh, your your mic is on mute. I actually didn't have my hand up, but since you called on me, yes, um, I will say I'm so glad you chose this topic. Uh, prior to now, I had always thought of Louis Sullivan as just sort of an adjunct to um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, oh, he studied with Louis Sullivan, but now let's get on to Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. And it is such a treat to see the roots of and the inspiration and the real importance, significance, and largeness of Louis Sullivan. And I really appreciate the way you handled the presentation of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, next up is Marisa, Lisa, and Ed. Marisa, go ahead. So this was a really informative um, session for me. Thanks to you both. Um, it was very enjoyable. I think for me, um, my takeaway is actually something that you said, Shir Kant, is um, kind of resonated. You said true function is always trying to find its form. I think that's a, a great um, kind of like a, a metaphor for a way for a person individually to attempt to find a structure and order in one's life. It seems like it's a good hone and beacon for yes. people. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Lisa. Lisa, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Hey. Thank you. I appreciate this whole whole section that you're putting on for the fifty living two living ideas. I get what I got from all this function and form function from the inside and form on the outside mm. and making all of it the same. <laughs> and that's what I took away from this. And that brought tears to my eyes. And there was mm. a time I had to bow out of the, the whole conversation because I had quite a bit of a swell up. So I, you're talking about thinking that I didn't write down because I was swelling up with tears. And that's exactly how I think and I've ha never had anybody talk to me in those words, and it was so beautiful. <laughs> it, um, it, trust me, you guys were lucky that I didn't lose it just reading his words. <laughs> it's usually when I get to every inch of it tall, I just, I'm a, I'm a waterworks myself. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate that. Uh, next up is Ed, Joe, and Paul. I thank you very much, Sherry. It was fascinating. I appreciated uh, to uh, learn about the relationship between Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, a form and function is, is incredible. I've been in dozens of uh, his homes and they're just incredible. Mm -hmm. In uh, Evanston, Illinois, Buffalo, New York, and uh, many other places. And, uh, you know, the he, he is, you know, one of my favorites. And Chicago is certainly a fascinating city with an incredible architecture. I also am going to reread The Fountainhead. I'm not an Ayn Rand fan. I did see the movie. I like Gary Cooper in the movie. I like the way the movie was pre presented. But I would like to uh, look at it again from uh, 
you, the perspective that you've given and uh, see if I can maybe appreciate Ayn Rand a little better, maybe not philosophically, but her roots are how she developed uh, the interest. Good, thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Joe, Paul, and Marjorie. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there are certain parts of uh, kindergarten chats that I actually have to go back and read now and really think about a little bit differently and how closely this is actually related to analyzing the human experience itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that's what I'm, my main takeaway is, is how design and the human experience are so intrinsically linked. And uh, as well, that this is our, as far as some of the functional aspects of it, even within modern finance, I still have some ideas about banks and their multiple uses and his designs. I'm going to go look at a little bit more closely as well. Good, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joel. Get a chance, go see them in person. It's always better in person. Uh, next up is uh, Paul. Paul, go ahead. Um, so one more time, Shuri and Shikan, thank you very much for uh, introducing uh, Ruth Sullivan. And basically, it helped me make my my decision stronger that I will continue design what I like design and that it will give me more satisfaction because I was designing only what I could sell. And now, uh, lately, last couple of years, I'm designing what I like to design. And it's definitely much more rewarding than just to design for customers. If I can design what I have in my head, it's much, I'm much more satisfied uh, with, the, with the product on the end. And uh, you gave me with, uh, you, you gave me a reason to do it, basically. You helped me to, um, to, to be satisfied with what I am doing, even though it's not so financially so, uh, so viable. Mm. Thank you, Paul. I, I am right there with you. Um, designing what I like, uh, so much more rewarding. Yeah. Some, uh, sometimes you don't have, you cannot look just on the, on the finances because um, I don't know if you, you are architect, I am just licensed designer. Um, you, you listen to your customers sometimes, you know that they are wrong and you cannot just you cannot talk them into into the proper uh, proper way of thinking because they saw something and it's not technically possible or that you know that it will it will be disaster on the end. So what I'm trying to do just yeah. to design and build and then then then, then deal with it. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you, Paul. Uh, next up is Marjorie, Pi, and Loy. Marjorie, go ahead. Well, I, I feel like I'm all over the place because what I focused on initially was your concern that you couldn't communicate what it was about this person that changed people's lives or that were basic. So being a writer and a language person, I focused on that. And um, that's where I got the thing about maybe if he were less poetic, he could communicate better, you know. Um, but then... You kept going on, and it seems almost like there are a lot of architects here. And are you an architect, Shirkan? Nope. Oh, so it's not just for architects. Nope. You know, the first time I'm here. Okay. I'm an architect. Uh, I know. So, so Marjorie, uh, there, there are many, you know, we, we, we do this. We've been doing this every day. So I'm glad that you're here for the first. So what uh, you want to add anything to your takeaways? Um. Well, I did notice that the things that have to do with people, I'm very impressed by what everybody said here, the people who have attended, by the way. Very impressed. Yeah. Marjorie, Marjorie, okay, I want to tell you a couple of things. There are amazing people who show up here. Yeah, very. Yeah. Okay. Which is that's unusual number one. For these that's human things. Yes, yeah. that's one thing. Second, I've done four meetups on language. So have a look at them. If you go to ah. YouTube, 52 Living Ideas, and let me know what you think. All right, so next up is- um... oh, Wait, 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 I'm not finished. Okay. So I was saying the two things I, I was, uh, was a t sort of a takeaway is to go back and be a child. Like Picasso said, he spent his whole life trying to draw like a child. 
And the other thing was the Buddhist thing about life in the past is a uh, history and the future it's a dream and the present it's memory. So those were the two things I grasped onto that had to do with, with people. And yes, all I can say is I'm a bit confused about where things are, but it's very impressive and I congratulate you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thanks. It's, it's uh, you know, there are lots of people and lots of things going on. So it's a little bit messy. That's the nature of things when you have 50 people, amazing people interacting with each other. So don't worry about the confusion. As long as you okay. think it's great, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Peggy, you have your hand up. So I'm going to go to you next. Peggy, go ahead. Oh, thank you. It was wonderful. You're changing my life. Um, I took it as, um, as Marjorie was saying, playing in the moment like partly Buddhism, living in the moment, not the past or the future, and play, um, also playing like a child. So I'm going back to uh, working on my 3D printer where I played and started to invent things. <laughs> but then I had another idea, but I, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sorry Peggy. for my tremor. <laughs> No, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Peggy. I really appreciate that. Uh, Sherry, you wanted to say something? No, I think that's okay. beautiful. I, I love thank the you. idea of uh, playing. I think, um, I think when you're doing the right thing in life, you feel like every day yeah. is, you want to get up. Yeah. You want to do it because it's just a joy to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and both those po points about um, being a child and being in the present, uh, those are very profound points. They're very simple points. I mean, what it points to is that he's saying that this is natural. This is natural part of who we are. And you can see it in children and you can see it in yourself as a child. And it's kind of, it's all about, you know, kind of unlearning things and kind of getting rid of things yeah. that are stopping you so yeah. you can operate more more naturally. Uh, next up is um, Loy. Um, Marina and Sanjay. Loy, go ahead. Okay, this, is, this subject is new to me. Thank you for the pre presentation. I learned a lot for it, from it. The main thing that struck me this in, evening, besides how form and function delays, is the idea of thinking in in the raw form way, like, like using in, like images or con, con, um I guess that's how thinking is done, but very few people have say, let me shut off the, the mm -hmm. clock. <laughs> it's like I have an alarm bell, that's stupid. No problem, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, the thing is, you can think in, in uh, whatever way you, uh, like in a raw form, unexpressed, but in order to ex to communicate it, you have to either roll out the diagrams or or translate into languages, and that's how I'm thinking. How this delay back to the um, intuition and logic in the when uh, how to use like change from one phase to another that we we learn in another. Uh, another session on the language on writing mm -hmm. and how the two delay. Thank you. Thank you, Loy. Uh, next up is Marina, Sanjay, and uh, Christian. Marina, I'm, go ahead. I'm going to give you takeaways that you're not going to like, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, Marina, I'm used to you do just criticizing everything, so go ahead. I'm amazed how easily Sherry has managed to get people to do that I've been trying so hard to do for the last three decades, since my friends call me the incarnation of NREM. Because I used to speak uh, things that, she, that later on I read in her books. Uh, I also want to thank Sherry for allowing us to ask questions afterwards. Okay. And my biggest point, I'm still stunned that uh, you, with your philosophy in life, would do anything that propagates and ran. Okay. Uh, next up is Sanjay, uh, Christian, and let me see, 
and Sandy. Go ahead. Um, Sanjay. Uh, yes, so for me, um, takeaway was that I was not as familiar with Sullivan. Um, I um, learned obviously that he was the father of skyscrapers. And I did not know that he was uh, he and Frank Lloyd Wright were contemporaries, uh, possibly with complementary styles and philosophies. Um, something that really I found, I don't know if, if this is necessarily ironic, but um, one thing that I, I find interesting is that they're, both of their styles, their, their function and their structures were based on the operating environments in which they worked in, in the city versus nature. And ultimately that resulted in, in affecting the forms that they, that they developed. So in a sense, the, uh, the span of their works um, contrasting each other almost seems like it, it function followed form um, or sorry, form followed, no, function followed form, yeah. Um, so anyway, so um, the other point that, that I got out of this that I thought was pretty interesting, um, there was a quote that you read of him uh, where he was describing uh, the entrance of a building and he said that the entrance should always be designed for the eye to naturally gravitate to the entrance. And that's actually a very, I mean, extremely art. It, it's, it's at the center of most art forms that a mm -hmm. true artist really takes the viewer's eyes on a journey. And I was very surprised to, uh, to hear that uh, he said that. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, next up is going to be Christian, uh, Elena, and Herb. Yeah, let's see if my uh, audio works. Can you hear me? It works yep. perfectly. Go ahead. Okay, Christian. awesome. Great. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I think my, my biggest takeaway uh, that comes to mind uh, very intensely is, is the, the, very, the, the great power of analyzing phenomena in terms of form and function and in particular, looking very carefully at, at function, not as it appears or is stated, but trying to be objective about function. And then, and then um, that, that will explain so much about both, both the form and the fo form might in its ugliness or, or perfection or, or um, um, uh, these manifestations like how uh, there's this hidden thing underneath, which is which is function. I, I find that very fascinating. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Uh, next up is uh, Elena and Herb. Elena, go ahead. Okay, uh, Herb, it's you. Next, Herb, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, next, uh, Arb, can you hear me? Nope, okay. So next one is Mike and then D. Mike, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, somehow I'm having trouble unmuting at these times. Uh, uh, civilization has always been marked by architecture uh, from the uh, um, Egyptians to the uh, uh, Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Templars, uh, the and uh, and our modern uh, the modern people we've talked about today, and um, uh, I think that uh, uh, you can say that um, uh, just as uh, and the older thing, the invention of the arch drove a lot of these things, and the invention of the kinds of materials they used in the Middle Ages. And, uh, and, and, and the ancients uh, drove a lot of things. The, the invention of the I-beam and the steel wall, the curtain wall construction, where you hang, uh, the, instead of having a foundation as important as it is, because some of these uh, high, skyscrapers, skyscrapers are designed like boats that float on the sand. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you hang the uh, uh, the walls from the I beams that become a curtain, and so that drove a lot of the architecture. But it's always a case of what you see is what you get, and uh, so, and uh, uh, 
today we uh, made we defined civilization as driven by architecture, and it was a fascinating journey. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is uh, Albert, and then uh, John Leckerman. Uh, Albert, go ahead. Albert? On you, yes. For me, uh, uh, form often comes from just mathematical expressions. The Mandelbrot set and other things. Exquisite figures, we just marvel at them, and yet what function do they have? Well, they perform a function for us, but in and of themselves, they were derived either statistically from complex numbers. Symmetry often comes, you know, from uh, a Fourier transform of uh, Fibonacci numbers. Uh, and uh, that seems just completely in a different universe from what you guys have been talking about. Uh, I mean, the way in which, uh, you know, uh, people look at it, it's that this is another way of looking at the same thing is that this is a same function repeating itself, kind of dividing it further. So, you know, I, I definitely look at all fractals as like expression of functions, kind of subdividing into functions. You can look at it at function or form because in this sense, function and form are just two ways of looking at the same thing. If you look at the outward expression of it, you call it form. If you look at kind of the driving force, like the, the cell dividing itself, the process of dividing of the cell, you would call the function uh, of procreation. And then the structure of the cells that we see in, let's say, a plant structure, the spirals that we see, we call it form. But there is a function behind it. So similarly, the same kind of uh, principle would apply for, for these ones too. Uh, it's just two different ways of looking at the same thing. Yeah, frequently the forms are, are in biology uh, are, are no longer needed and so they, they remain and that's, that's contrary to what you said. You know, Sullivan was able to uh, talk about form Hollis function, but then he began to put these decorations I mean, what was the point of the decorations? Well, yeah, they're pretty, but uh, they're, okay, they're, let me, they're let me have you like like them. Not any of the not any of the things that he said the building had to do. None of them were listed. I wonder what your architect has to say about that. Sure, one. Oh. sure, uh, Albert. I will have uh, Sherry uh, address that. I think we're coming to the end of the takeaway. So one uh, question for Sherry after after this is done is what is the role of decoration in the architect of Louis Sullivan? So now next up is uh, Gretchen and John Lickerman. Uh, Gretchen, go ahead. Okay, next one is John Lickerman. Thanks, which, thanks. Yeah. I'm just gonna pass. Uh, thank All you right. there. Sounds good. Um, next up is John Lickerman. Would you like to say something? All right, then uh, next one is uh, John Roth. John. Uh, let me see if John is here. No, John has left. Okay. All right. So then we can now go to questions. Um, so the first one is uh, about the decoration. Go ahead. I think Maxine has a question. Maxine, go ahead. Well, I don't have a question, but you didn't oh, ask for my oh, oh, sorry, sorry. So what happens is that all these all these faces keep moving on in Zoom. So you you got uh, sorry about that, Maxine. Go ahead. Okay, um, I thank you very much for this talk. It really gave me something to think about. Um, I. I'm not familiar with Sullivan's work, but I live about five minutes from two rows of Frank Lloyd Wright houses. Now, I almost bought one 45 years ago. Yes, yes. But I couldn't because it wasn't functional. Um, it, the, it had a winding staircase without a railing 
I mean, it was 45 years ago. I could have lived with that. But do you want your kids flowing down the stairs? I mean, it, the kitchen was very, very small. Everything was scaled wrong somehow. But it was beautiful. You would walk in and you would really be impressed. And the whole row was for sale and each house was individual but each house was non-functional <laughs> so I uh, maybe we'll go back and take a look at them again and maybe I will look at Sullivan I love his philosophy I may not like his houses but I do like his philosophy because I I uh, went to the actor's studio for 10 years and they had the same philosophies. And they, um, everything was moment to moment. Everything, it was childlike. If you, the most creative people are childlike. Um, they, um, well, the lowest point, um, you said that he wrote the book at the lowest point in his life. Well, that's when most creativity takes place. It's a look at Mozart, look, look at all the composers and all the uh, painters and they had to wait till they were destitute and then they were creative. Um, and so this, another thing he spoke about, um, it, it isn't good to speak. Uh, you have to see what's going on. Well, that's for, they don't let you speak in the actor's studio. You have to do scenes without speaking because all the people that are speaking aren't really doing moment to moment. You can't really see what's happening. So uh, all these things bring back things to think about. And um, thank you. Very Thank nice. you. Thank All you, right. Maxine. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, now, Sherry, would you like to pick up on any of the things? So one of the specific questions is about a role of decoration. Uh, second one, implicit question about the functionality of uh, Frank, Lloyd Wright. uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's houses uh, yeah. <laughs> and any other themes you want to pick up. Yeah, let me, let me hit those first two and remind me because sometimes I get lost and I forget the next question. Um, I will keep track. Thank you. Albert's question about, um, see, what was it again? <laughs> uh, her question, you know, her, his question was, you know, he, he was saying that it looks to him like the, what's the function yeah. of the decoration? Yep. Um, I think really you need to remember um, what he says. It's about drawing the eye. So when you look at Frank, at, at, no, excuse me, if you look at Sullivan's decoration, he uses it very specifically. Um, and it's, and it's detail that's um, usually texture, not usually color, but it's a textural detail that catches your attention. And it's very much like an artist that will draw you, like I mentioned before, through a painting. Um, this is an issue that I talk about um, back when I did the architecture tours in Chicago. Um, we used to go to Frank Lloyd Wright's, one of his earliest buildings called the Rookery. And um, I made the point about um, the way our eyes work. Um, you, need, uh, you need a certain amount of detail um, because we have our eyes do these little jiggle jiggle back and forth because we're always looking for some kind of a contrast uh, for our eyes to settle on. Um, they always just randomly do these little spirals. Um, and, I don't know that Wright or Sullivan understood this at a, at a scientific level, but you can see, and especially in their early works, they scale the detail depending on how far away you would be. Um, so for example, in the rookery, the detail that's there, the function of it is to, to give you something for your eye to focus on, because if you're in a completely white, um, sun bleached structure, and this is actually what we did in this tour, we would go to one of these buildings and your, your eyes wouldn't, they would just spin. 
it was a really uncomfortable physical feeling, a physiological feeling you would get. And then we would go to the rookery and you had, wherever you were in the space, you had a level of detail that allowed your eyes to focus, not so much that it was distracting, but just enough so that it was almost soothing in a way. Um, and I could probably, if I had known we were going to talk about this, I probably could have prepared that a little bit more detail. But I really think that the detail is functioning in a physiological way. It's causing um, your, your, your visual cortex to have enough things to look at and focus at um, to keep you in, from floating away. Um, but at the same time, not so much that it's so distracting that you can't function because you feel like you're in a pinball machine. Okay. So I really think there's a function to it. Every single architect's detail um, manifests in a different way. So the poet Sullivan's, uh, who spent most of his formative uh, education in the forest, and whose father was Irish and has very twisty, turny, almost Celtic feel to it. So I think that's, um, it's his personal uh, style that is attached to it, that says that it's his. Okay, um, we're getting, it's getting a little late. So Sherry, what were your takeaways from this ah. entire experience and all the takeaways that you heard? Well, I, Srikant and I, for all of you, we have been talking about Louis Sullivan since we met. So Srikant knew my husband um, before I knew my husband. Um, and so they had their own, really, their own friendship. Um, and we met, I think it was at a conference. So we sh I show up at the conference and I'm finally meeting Srikant, who my husband has known for all these years. And he comes and he introduces himself. And the very first words out of his mouth were, have you read kindergarten chats? <laughs> <laughs> so this is like, as Sullivan would put it, it's like the flowering of an idea. I am delighted that this finally worked this way because um, I think all the conversations we've had over the years about Sullivan are finally crystallizing and um, making sense for people. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, what I want to do is, I, uh, I mean, my take is that I thought we did a little better job than what I, you know, what I've done before. I think people got, at least many people seem to have gotten that it's worth reading Sullivan. And uh, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm planning to do more meetups on Sullivan. I will try to figure out how to do it. I'll see if I can rope uh, Sherry in because that always is a like a trump card. And it's like, because she provides a lot more kind of detail and richness and kind of connecting things and application of things much better than I do. So I think, I think it's, you know, it's like this, inter, you know, this interaction works really well. Um, but I'm going to try to map out uh, what else. Um, and I'll be putting this video on YouTube and I'm also starting blog posts where people can put comments and ask questions. So that way we can continue this conversation and um, we'll feel, but I'm really curious to see how, what is the impact of this presentation? Does anybody, how many of you actually get something, you know, significant out of it? It is one thing to say, okay, this looks really amazing. It was amazing. I got something. The question is, what is the, you know, how much did you get out of it over a period of time? Um, and so that's, that's something I'm very curious about. And, uh, but with that, uh, I'm going to say uh, good night and we will see you, uh, see you soon. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Really oh, appreciate it. You. It was delightful as always. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thanks. Bye. Bye.